Our first love always holds a special place in our hearts. There's something about that spark when that puppy love becomes a little bit more mature. He was her first love. This was a person she felt like she was going to spend the rest of her life with. But there's a fine line between puppy love and blind obedience. Puppy here and puppy. He had all the control in this relationship. What happens when following your heart leads you past the point of no return? When she heard the seriousness of his voice, she knew she needed to get her man back. And what if the person you thought had your back is really plotting your demise? All the red flags are just ping, ping, ping. When you are in an emotional situation, you will do things that you would never imagine. This was a woman that opened her heart and her front door to a man that basically threw her under the bus. February 1st, 2009. A cold winter wind chills the air across the harbor city of Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore is known as Charm City. We're big on sports, we're big on entertainment, and we're just like our name. We're very charming people. When you hear about Baltimore in the media, you hear high crime rate, you hear rats, you hear corruption, and there might be elements of truth to that. But in my experience, Baltimore has been a community. But for the Baltimore Police Department, that sense of community isn't always evident. In Baltimore, people don't go to the police as a first option. They go to the police when they run out of options. So when a 23-year-old woman named Monique Grayson walks into police headquarters that afternoon, something must be seriously wrong. Monique tells the desk sergeant that her boyfriend, Eric Pendergrass, has been kidnapped. You could hear it in her voice that she was clearly shaken and genuinely wanted our help. Monique tells police the night before Eric had told her that they would see each other that evening and she was looking forward to it. However, Eric never showed up. She wasn't really that concerned until she got a very strange phone call around 1, 1.30 in the morning. It was Eric. But he didn't sound like himself. In fact, he sounded very shook up. He instructed Monique to go into the closet, take out $10,000 from a bag, and take it to his mother's home. She tried to ask why, but Eric cut her off. He told her to follow the instructions, just obey, take the money to his mother's house. She could hear the tone in his voice that he wasn't playing around. This was dead serious. Monique tells detectives she carefully wrapped the cash in $1,000 stacks. She wrapped the money up a very specific way. She put rubber bands on the two ends of each stack. She placed the money in a paper bag. Monique took that bag, jumped in her car, and drove about 20 minutes to get to his mom's house. Monique was supposed to wait there for a woman named Darlene, someone she didn't know. Shortly after getting there, a female showed up. It was Darlene. She said that she was there for Monique's boyfriend. Monique knew right away what that was about. Monique knows something is going on and that something isn't good. But Monique did as instructed. She handed Darlene the bag of money. At that point, Darlene walks away and gets into this Cadillac and drives off. In the hours since then, Monique says she tried calling Eric's cell phone dozens of times with no answer. Now, she's fearing the worst. She's pretty convinced that he's in danger and that something is going on. Born and bred in Baltimore, 
Eric Pendergrass was always the center of attention in his big, close-knit family. He was a very charismatic person. He had a large circle of supporters and friends, and he was kind of popular in high school. Everyone loved him in the community. He was affectionately given the name Boo Boo by all of his friends. And to Eric, coming from a big family made him eager to start his own. He became a dad at a young age, but he took that role very seriously. Eric loved his sons. He was at every Little League game, every basketball game. He was that kind of dad. Eric was a stable father figure for his two sons, but his romantic relationships weren't quite so steady. By his mid-twenties, he was still searching for his soulmate. A lot of people are playing the field at that age, but not Eric. He wanted a mother for his children. When he met a warm-hearted young woman named Monique Grayson, he knew he'd found her. She was the one he wanted to settle down with. He wanted to raise his two boys with this woman, and they wanted to be a family. Monique was his bright light, like his love of his life. Now, 12 hours after Monique handed a $10,000 ransom over to a mysterious woman named Darlene, Eric is still missing. Monique did manage to get one crucial piece of information before Darlene vanished into the night. Monique had the presence of mind to go outside and get the tag of the car and get the make and model of the car. That's important because that links you to the person that's registered to that car. Now they can run that plate in the system and they can track down who exactly this Cadillac belongs to. February 1st, 2009. Baltimore police have officially opened a missing persons case for 26-year-old Eric Boo Pendergrass. According to his girlfriend, Monique, Eric is being held captive even after she paid $10,000 to a mystery woman known only as Darlene. Monique knew right away when the car drove off and she didn't get her boyfriend back, she realized, oh my goodness, I gotta get in touch with the police and let them know what's going on. Thankfully, Monique did manage to get the license plate from Darlene's car as she drove away. When detectives enter the license plate into the system, they immediately get a hit. The owner of the Cadillac is a 38-year-old man named Roy Dean. Judging by his rap sheet, Roy Dean is a hardened criminal with a history of violent crime. They went to the house of the registered owner, and that's when detectives saw the vehicle actually near the house. They knew they were on the right trail. When detectives approach the home, Roy and an unknown woman come to the door. Roy greets them politely, and then he introduces his girlfriend, Tia. When detectives see Tia, they immediately think, is this the infamous Darlene? Detectives tell the couple they're looking for Eric Pendergrass. Detectives tell Roy that the Cadillac that's parked right in front of Roy's house was involved in a pickup of a $10,000 ransom just the night before. Roy denies any knowledge of any ransom pickup, anything having to deal with Eric. Roy says, I loaned out my vehicle to somebody. I only know him by his first name, Markel. Most people, they don't like to loan their car. And if you do loan your car, you would at least know the person's first and last name. Immediately, I say to my partner, the victim could be in the trunk. We're going to have to search this car. But when detectives search Roy's property, there's no sign of their missing man. Eric was not in the trunk, <laughs> I'm happy to say. However, 
we did find evidence in the apartment. They found about $2,000 with the rubber bands wrapped on each ends of each stack. The stacks of cash fit Monique's description of the ransom money to a T. It wasn't the whole amount, but we knew the amount that he had was part of the original ransom that she had given to the unknown female. Along with the money, detectives find hundreds of rounds of ammunition. Now, this is problematic because Roy has a criminal record. We didn't know specifically how much of a role he played, but we knew he played a role. So we were able to send him off to federal jail while we continue the investigation. The detective decides to take a picture of Tia and send it to Monique. They were very confident that Tia would be identified as the Darlene. But to detective surprise, Monique tells them that Tia is not the woman she gave the bag of money to the night before. Tia is not Darlene. Does that mean Roy and Tia are telling the truth? Maybe he just phoned his car out to his friend, Markel. But with only a first name to go on, police have no way to track Markel down, if he even exists. With each passing hour, Eric's chances of survival are growing dim. Days go by and there's no word from Eric. There's no call, there's no sightings, there's not even any word on the street as to Eric's whereabouts. Then on February 5th, Monique Grayson returns to police headquarters with another shocking story. Monique admits to police that she made another ransom drop. I received a text from someone claiming to be uh, Google's friend, the text messages basically asking for money for Eric's return. Yeah. The kidnappers were upset. They said, what is this, a joke? We know he has more money. We want more. They were going to be agitated and upset, so they were making threats like, we're going to approach him here. The victim had told the kidnapper, hey, listen, I just sold a car. We got a check for 30000 Tell my girl that she can get that $30,000 check and cash it. They said if she does not have this money sent to the person that's holding Eric, that he will die. And you agree to pay $30,000 to them? Yes. Yeah. This time, the kidnappers told Monique to leave the money in the stairwell of an apartment complex. She'll probably just be listening. I just want you to go down to the bottom floor and put the money underneath the stairwell. Okay. And you did that? Yeah. She was told that they would drop him off at a movie theater not too far from where she dropped off the money. But when she went to the location to pick him up, no one showed up. The first thing detectives want to know is why Monique waited to inform them about this second ransom. We said, why didn't you contact us? What were you thinking? Why would you do something like this and not contact us? We could have possibly set up at the apartment complex prior to the drop and video recorded everything. Unfortunately, we never even got a chance to do that. which means the investigators are no closer to locating Eric or his kidnappers. Until a few days later, when they receive the phone call that everyone has been dreading. A body was found floating in the Patasco River. Their worst nightmare came true. February 2009, for over a week, Baltimore detectives have been trailing the unidentified kidnappers of 26-year-old Eric Pendergrass. Eric's girlfriend, Monique, had already paid the kidnappers $40,000 in ransom money, but they still hadn't released her boyfriend. Several days had gone by, and we hadn't heard from him. But now, investigators may be one step closer to unraveling this mystery. February 9th, police received a call that a body, an adult black male's body, was found in the Patapsco River. 
when detectives arrive on the scene, they see this young black man in his 20s wrapped in a blanket with his hands and feet bound. When the body is pulled from the river, detectives immediately recognize him. It's Eric Pendergrass. He had very distinctive tattoos on his body. When I saw him, I knew right away it was him. There's no clear indication of how Eric died until he undergoes an autopsy. The medical examiner doctor said, well, he died of asphyxiation, but he was dead before he hit the water. There's no water in the lungs. That was going to tell our detectives that at that point, this person may have been killed somewhere else, and then their body was thrown into the water. Detectives now face the grim task of breaking the news to Eric's loved ones. I've been in the homicide unit for 15 years. By far, the hardest part of the job is notifying the family of the death of their family member. Yet through their grief, Eric's family members make an important observation. They asked about Eric's watch because he wore the same one every day. But when they pulled his body from the river, there was no watch. Police put out a bolo to all the pawn shops in the area. They told them to be on the lookout for this particular watch. Months go by without any new developments in Eric's case until May 4th when investigators get an unexpected tip. They receive a call from a man named Kalik. He claims to have information that the police have been waiting to hear. At the station, Kalik delivers on his promise. And he goes, well, I was supposed to be part of that kidnapping plot. And I'm like, what? He said, dude, I was at the house. Kalik Simpson informs police that he knows exactly who killed Eric Pendergrass. He identifies the killers as Markel Washington and his girlfriend, 28-year-old Sherelle Ferguson. The name Markel is familiar to detectives. It's the same name provided by Roy Dean months earlier. Mr. Simpson tells the authorities that in January, he and Roy, Markel, and Sherelle met up. According to Kalik, the group was scheming on ways to come up with some quick cash when Eric's name came up. They all knew that Eric always had a lot of money on him. So they said, hey, we're going to grab him and we're going to take some money from him. Kalik goes on to tell me they're plotting on how they're going to do that. They're going to hold him and demand the ransom. But Kalik tells detectives that as the plotting continued, he got cold feet. Kalik said, hey, man, I'm not with this. I'm leaving. And he left the apartment. When Kalik saw on the news that Eric was found dead, he knew immediately that they went through with the plan. It weighed heavily on his conscience until Kalik had to speak up and tell exactly what he knew. Could Markel's alleged girlfriend, Sherelle Ferguson, be the mysterious Darlene that obtained the ransom money from Monique? They pulled her driver's license photo from the DMV. Detectives bring Monique Grayson back in to view the photo. We spoke on the phone, and I asked you to come in to look at some photographs. Is that right? Yeah. We actually put together a photographic array with Sherelle in it. Is there an individual that you selected? No. Yeah. She was like, this is the girl that drove here in the Cadillac. This is the girl that took the bag. So now the investigation starts to roll. In the summer of 2009, 
a witness has identified Markel Washington and his girlfriend, Sherelle Ferguson, as two of the three people involved in the murder of Eric Boo Boo Pendergrass. She's an active participant, and well, we know this. We're getting it directly from the victim's girlfriend. So the police go out into the community and try to see what they can find out about Sherelle. Raised by her grandfather, Sherelle Ferguson had a great childhood. But when she hit her teenage years, her wild streak led her straight into the arms of fellow classmate, Markel Washington. He was her first love. This was a person that she felt like she was going to spend the rest of her life with. But all that changed their senior year. Because of his decisions, he ended up going to jail. So her future has drastically changed, and there's a shock. With Markel behind bars, Sherelle moved on to graduate high school and start a career. She became a nursing assistant and was dating different people, but no one quite lived up to Markel. While in prison, Markel worked hard to turn things around. And at his parole hearing, his efforts paid off. A little good behavior goes a long way, and the judge was so impressed that he got 60 months shaved off of his sentence. But after his release, Markel once again faced the dark side of Baltimore. He's trying to get his life back together, but it is very hard after he's been locked up. He ended up living on the streets. But as fate would have it, he looked up and he ran into Sherelle Ferguson. For Sherelle, it was like no time had passed at all. When she sees Markel back in the neighborhood, all the old feelings comes back again. She hadn't quite fully gotten over her love for him. Something about that spark, when that puppy love becomes a little bit more mature, and that's what Sherelle was feeling all over again with him. She invited him to come live with her and everything. She knew in her heart that Markel was her Prince Charming. But now, police are wondering if these two young lovers have also become partners in crime. Sherelle has been identified as Darlene, so the police end up tracking her down. In an interrogation room, Sherelle denies knowing anything about Eric's kidnapping or murder. She kind of resisted, I don't know what you're talking about type of deal, and we said, look, you're now a co-conspirator to a homicide, and it would be in your best interest to tell us what you know. Sherelle admits that on the night of January 31st, she was at the apartment with Markel and Roy Dean. I was a mention of I got a boo boo screwed over. And I'm not sure exactly who brought it up, but it was a screaming guy. Well, going to Sherelle, Markel said she had to leave because it's going to be a guy's night. And so as she's heading out to her car to leave, she sees Mr. Pendergrass go into the apartment building. You saw boo boo arrive. Sherelle tells detectives that she left for a couple of hours to let Markel have his guy's night. But when she returned, he was waiting for her in the parking lot. He's driving this Cadillac and is asking her if she could go with him somewhere. Look at the car, I need you to go for the bag. I was under the impression that she had a problem with driving. Or maybe my bag, I had no idea. Sherelle says when they arrived at their destination, Markel waited in the car while she went to get the bag of money from Monique. Even though deep in her heart, Sherelle knew something was off, something didn't feel right, she did it for her man. After securing the cash, Sherelle says she drove Markel back to their apartment. Roy Dean was still inside, but there was no sign of Eric Pendergrass. She had an immediate bad feeling. Sherelle told the detectives that she just kind of gave up and just left at that point. That thing that's getting my day up. Now, you said that you came back to the apartment the next day. Is that correct? Yeah. 
That afternoon, Sherelle says that she went into the apartment bathroom and saw another unsettling sign. There's blood stains on the floor. She proceeds to clean up the blood stains. I just scrubbed it clearly. Just scrubbing it. Why did you start scrubbing? I don't know. Sherelle had warning bells going off in her head. Every red flag was standing prominent, but she still did it. It wasn't until a week later, when Eric's body was found in the Patapsco River, that she finally pieced things together. Sherelle says that's when things really start to click. So when she confronted Markel about it, Markel got upset, of course, and they had a big argument. Well, going to Sherelle, then Markel tells her that if anyone's going down for this, it's not me, it's you, because you went and got the ransom money. So instead of going to the police, Sherelle kept her mouth shut. Sherelle, realizing the position that she was in, told us that she basically went along with what he was saying. At the end of her interview, Sherelle says she's willing to help the police build their case against Markel. So they decide to release her. They were treating her as a witness, not a suspect. So now they're looking for Markel Washington. But before they can track him down, a 911 call comes in to Baltimore police around 3 a.m. on July 18th. According to the caller, a man is beating a woman inside a car in an empty parking lot. The police show up and there's no car, but there is a badly beaten woman lying on the ground. He had assaulted her and then left the air and stole the car. The woman is Sherelle Ferguson. July 2009. Detectives in Baltimore, Maryland are zeroing in on an ex-con named Markel Washington for the murder of Eric Boo Boo Pendergrass. Markel's girlfriend, Sherelle Ferguson, has painted him as the mastermind behind the kidnapping plot that yielded $40,000 in ransom. But then the case took a turn on July 18th when police responded to a 911 call and found Sherelle beaten up in a parking lot. Markel assaulted Sherelle and actually stole Sherelle's car. Police put out a bolo for the stolen vehicle and quickly locate Markel driving it nearby. Sherelle was so outdone and so hurt by Markel, she couldn't take it anymore. Sherelle had Markel arrested for domestic violence and for stealing her car. But at the station, Markel flips the script, claiming that he'd only taken off with the car because Sherelle was hitting him. I think Markel is a very manipulative person. He was the type of person that in one breath, you'd go, oh, this guy's pretty cool. And in the next breath, you'd go, oh man, he should be behind bars. When the questions shift to the murder of Eric Pendergrass, Markel doesn't budge. It was almost like he wanted to admit to doing it because he was proud of how he pulled it off. But he also knew that admitting anything, he'd be charged with murder. Markel tells police that he and Eric were friends. Eric was his boy. Eric helped him out. Police don't buy it for a second. But they also don't have enough evidence to charge him with killing Eric. There needs to be more than just an accomplice ratting him out. They need something substantial to pin murder charges on Markel Washington. So while Markel is held in custody for violating his parole, Investigators take the opportunity to search the apartment he shares with Sherelle Ferguson. We found no traces of blood whatsoever, but we found heavy traces of cleaning products. The bathtub shower area was spotless. So we had a good idea that this actually happened in the bathroom. Once again, 
investigators are left with only circumstantial evidence. Mr. Washington, he's sent back to prison for violating his parole. And Roy, he's also sent to prison for 15 years for having ammunition in his home. Months go by without any new leads in Eric's case. Until, finally, a new development comes in November of 2010. More than a year after Eric's body was found in the Patapsco River, a tipster comes forward. In the old words, could you tell me what your relationship was with uh, and the rest? Peyton Grubbers out of the uh, line. The informant tells detectives that two months after his friend Eric was killed, he ran into Markel Washington. He was a little lying trying to come to Washington. Two months after he died. Right. He says that Markel did not indicate that it was Eric's watch, but the tipster recognized that it was Eric's watch. This was a watch that was custom made specifically for Eric and everyone knew it. He was even able to identify this watch in a police lineup of photographs. I'm gonna ask you in the record, is this the watch? Yeah, that's the, that's the, that's the watch. You have this information coming from somebody who wasn't connected to Eric's kidnapping, it wasn't connected to Eric's murder, but they're telling you that Markel offered this watch. That points a big finger back at Markel. How did he get that watch? The other shoe drops following Markel's release from prison for violating his parole. While Markel was serving his time, he kept writing letters to the judge overseeing his case. At one point during his federal incarceration, he had written a federal judge 27 times. That's how this guy was. And in some of the letters, he mentioned the case involving Eric Pendergrass. So the judge handed those over to law enforcement. When detectives review the correspondence, they're stunned. Markel throws Sherelle all the way under the bus. Maybe Sherelle has more to do with this than we thought she did. In the Baltimore area, there's a history of mistrust of police, and especially in the court system. So a lot of times, if you have a police officer up on the stand, chances are a majority of jury is not going to trust what that officer, what that detective is saying. They're not going to think that that's the truth. So there's a lot to overcome. You not only have to have your case wrapped up tight to meet that substantial threshold to be beyond a reasonable doubt, but you got to be able to convince a Baltimore jury, which is a whole nother level. Winter 2010. For nearly two years, police have suspected Markel Washington is the mastermind behind the murder of Eric Pendergrass. Now, Markel is trying to pin the crime on his former girlfriend, Sherelle Ferguson. In letters he wrote to a judge, Markel claimed that the plot to kill Eric was all Sherelle's idea. He was trying to place the blame on her. When police confront Sherelle with Markel's allegations, she reveals that there's more to the story than what she originally told them. She says the victim and a couple of his buddies were hanging out at a nightclub. Markel, you know, called and said, hey, I got your money, come on over. I'm, you know, right up the street. So the victim drove over, thinking that he was going to receive some money. Sherelle now admits she never left the apartment, as she originally stated. According to Sherelle, she opened the door for the victim and let him in. He goes upstairs and is greeted by Markel and Roy. He's beaten and basically tied up. He is told that he needs to get in touch with his girl and bring down some money to be released. But according to Sherelle, Markel wasn't satisfied with their $40,000 haul. They know Eric is making a lot of money, so they want a significant amount of money, and this wasn't enough. Sherelle says Eric was adamant he'd given them everything he had. And, sensing that his life was in danger, he started to fight back. 
They tried to handcuff Eric and keep him subdued, but it just, it wouldn't work. They decided that Eric had to die. The kidnappers lowered his head into the bathtub, but held his feet above water, basically inverting him so that he would suffocate. Because they held him upside down, that's the reason there was no water in his lungs during the autopsy. Sherelle's guilty knowledge places her at the crime scene without a shadow of doubt. One of the questions we asked was, why? Well, why would you participate in something like this? And she was like, I didn't think I had a choice, really. Markel and her had a history of abuse, both mental and physical. She truly was intimidated by him. In late September 2012, Prosecutors file murder charges against Markel Washington, Sherelle Ferguson, and Roy Dean. They're charged with first-degree murder, as well as first-degree assault, kidnapping, extortion, and false imprisonment. In a bid to secure a lighter sentence for herself, Sherelle agrees to plead guilty to the charges against her. She threw herself at the mercy of the court. Roy and Markel, on the other hand, opt to face a jury. Roy's defense team maintains that all he did was lend his car to the wrong person. They say he was just another victim of Markel's evil plot. But Markel contends that he's the true victim. Markel insists that he's being framed for this crime by Sherelle and that he and Sherelle were never a couple, but that Roy was actually her boyfriend. The jury sides with the prosecution and finds Markel and Roy guilty on all charges. On January 31st, 2014, five years to the day after Eric's murder, both men are sentenced to life in prison. Despite Sherelle's plea, the judge doesn't go any easier on her. Sherelle Ferguson is also sentenced to life in prison. The convictions come as a relief to Eric Pendergrass's family, as well as the citizens of Baltimore. But their peace proves short-lived after Markel is granted a new trial in the fall of 2015. When Markel appeals his case and he's granted a second trial, everyone is shocked. In an agreement to reduce her sentence, Sherelle agrees to testify against her former lover in the new proceedings. Markel betrayed Sherelle when he had tried to pin this crime on her. So now it was her turn to stick that knife right back into him. But when the new jury renders their verdict, everyone is stunned. Jury came back and actually found him not guilty. He's acquitted of all charges. He got off. The judgment leaves everyone in disbelief. We were really surprised. None of the evidence changed. So why they chose to acquit, it's something that they have to live with. But no one is more surprised than Sherelle Ferguson. This was a woman that opened her heart to a man that denied the love that she thought that they shared in favor of his own innocence. Markel walks out of that courtroom a free man that day. Sherelle actually took the fall for everything that happened in this situation. It still amazes me that there are people who depend on other people to kind of dictate their lives. With Sherelle, I know there were times when she felt like, I need to get away from this dude, but here I am, I'm still with him. Relationships can be complicated, but uh, when you're talking about your well-being, you really should listen to your body and love yourself first. Puppy love always feels perfect at first. And loyalty is rarely a bad thing. But sometimes, even the cutest puppies 
grow up to be dogs that bite back. And when a woman stays loyal to the wrong kind of love, she may find herself locked in a cage. Illinois single mom Annette Williams is focused on her career until she meets a sexy younger man who knocks her off her feet. Annette has finally found the guy she wants to spend the rest of her life with. But when he wants something out of reach, I want you to have my son. She turns their fairy tale ending into another family's deadly nightmare. Annette wasn't able to have a baby, but she would stop at nothing to get one. With everything she ever wanted, now Annette figures Fidel will never be taken away from her. And later, in Mount Vernon, Illinois, Krista Donahoe finds her soulmate in a man who thrived on danger. Krista was living on the edge, and I think that Demetrius gave her that outlet. There was nothing she would not do for him. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. Growing up in Wheaton, Illinois, Annette Williams' happy childhood teaches her that family can be one of life's greatest gifts. Annette was the oldest of three children. She was very happy. She was close to her parents. Her parents were a hard-working couple who were devoted to their children. Uh, they worked hard to support their family. The adored daughter wants for nothing throughout grade school. She had a pretty happy childhood. Uh, she was involved in her church and did pretty well in school. But as Annette grows into adolescence, her seemingly perfect world falls to pieces when she finds out that her parents aren't as devoted to each other as she thought and split up. The divorce seemed to affect her emotionally. She started to have uh, trouble with her grades. She started to display some behaviors at home in terms of acting out and misbehaving. What we see with children of divorce is they oftentimes are very upset, very depressed, very angry. So they act out to gain the attention of their parents. In the wake of her father moving out of the house, the teenager finds comfort in the arms of attractive men one after the other. Subsequently, she became pregnant at 16 years old by a, a young man who did not stick around. In fact, by the time the baby was born, he was gone. Plunged into parenthood, she drops out of high school to nurture her newborn. Her parents couldn't help her because they couldn't afford to just take care of another child along with her. So it was her obligation to try to take care of her child. Over the next year, the teen mom works hard in a daycare center to support her baby on her own while living under her mom's roof. But her new responsibilities don't stop the hopeless romantic from falling in love. She's raising her child and she meets someone else. She ends up getting married. By the time she's 17, she's a married mother. Over the next six years, they move into their own home and have two children together putting a financial strain on the household. The relationship is volatile. Constant arguments, going back and forth. She's finding it very, very difficult. And their lack of income adds fuel to the ever-growing fire. They began to fight. The fight led to more fights, and soon it became very violent. After her last child with him, she decided to get her tubes tied so that she would not have any more pregnancies unexpectedly. And so she begins to think about the future of her kids and what would be best for them. After seven years of marriage, the weary couple files for a divorce, and the 30-year-old father leaves and never turns back, not even for the kids. Annette decides that she has to do whatever she can to make sure that her children have the best life that they can possibly have. And she decides to go to school for a nursing assistant. Annette finishes her certified nursing program. She finds employment uh, with a local uh, nursing home. And now she can take care of her children. She feels that things are looking up for her, and she can move forward now in her life. Even though she started getting her life together after a divorce, there was something that was missing from her life, and that was having a family, having the love of someone who could cherish her. A year after her divorce, life will never be the same again after the 27-year-old catches the attention of well-known drug dealer Fidel Caffey. So Fidel sees this beautiful woman walking down the street. You know, he puts on the moves, and he asks her for her name and her number. 
He's talked in a very smooth and slick manner, and Annette was intrigued by Fidel's appearance. He was a light-skinned man with curly, wavy hair, and that was something that appealed to her. It's the first of many conversations to come in the next few weeks. They began to go out to date each other. The romance became very strong. After sharing stories of their broken childhood homes, they find out they both want the same thing for their futures, a family that sticks together. The relationship became so intense within a short period of time, just a matter of weeks. Fidel moves in with her and her children, and they begin to build a life together. Because of her boyfriend's lucrative drug trade, Annette feels completely taken care of for the first time in her life. In fact, the drug dealing is so good that Fidel tells Annette, look, you can stop working, I'll take care of you. Annette's fortunes had changed. Fidel had brought stability into her life in terms of providing a place to live, to take care of her children, and to bring a sense of comfort. She's not struggling so much anymore. For the first time in her life, she thinks she has everything she's ever hoped for, okay, so. until she finds out that her man still wants for something very dear. I want you to have my son. Fidel told Annette that he wanted her to have his baby, and he wanted this boy to be just like the both of them. But in particular, he wanted this boy to be light-skinned, just like he was. His words knock the wind out of her. Her secret from the past is still undusted. I have to tell you something. Annette had not told Fidel that she couldn't get pregnant. She felt that if she told Fidel that she could not have children, that he would probably leave her. Annette's heart wells up into her throat as she tells him she can't have children anymore. I can't have your son. He was disappointed, but he wasn't mad at her. He didn't throw her out. Their relationship didn't end. It's hard to swallow, but the devastating truth brings them closer. When Fidel saw Annette crying, when she broke down and told him that she couldn't have that baby that he wanted to have with her, he really felt bad for her. He really loved her. It didn't matter to Fidel that he and Annette couldn't physically have a baby themselves, as long as they were able to find a baby. I will get you a son. And when they find the perfect mark, she'll move hell on earth to get Fidel exactly what he wants. Everything she thought she needed was right inside of that woman, right in front of her. Annette proved there was nothing she wouldn't do to give Fidel what he wanted. In the outskirts of Chicago, mother of three Annette Williams and her boyfriend Fidel Caffey are ready to do whatever it takes to have a child together, even though Annette had her tubes tied during a previous relationship. It didn't matter to Fidel that he and Annette couldn't physically have a baby themselves as long as they were able to get a baby. And the dutiful girlfriend assures him that they will, and Fidel is game. We can work it out, man. It's me and you. A few weeks later, Annette's favorite cousin, 24-year-old Laverne Ward, pays a visit with some very compelling information. Annette found out that her cousin Laverne's ex-girlfriend is pregnant. So the wheels are turning now in Annette's mind. She's having a boy or a girl? She's having a boy. Annette was deeply interested in Deborah's pregnancy because Deborah was white, Laverne was black. Deborah was also pregnant with a boy. Like, I, I, I could just kill this girl. This is a, 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 a perfect situation. Right? This information triggers a spark between Fidel and Annette. So Deborah essentially was carrying the very type of child that Fidel wanted. I can't come to the house. I can't see her. I can't have any contact with my son. She's just getting a restraining order. And the couple can't believe their luck when Laverne laments about his failed relationship and the recent restraining order that's been slapped on him. It had turned violent so many times that Deborah kicked him out of her home and she wouldn't allow him to see their two-year-old son that they shared together. So Laverne is at a boiling point. He has one child with Deborah that he cannot see. Deborah is pregnant with his second child and he probably won't be able to see that child either. Laverne is so upset with Deborah that at one point he states that he's actually willing to kill Deborah in order to see his son. We will get your son. 
and we'll raise him as if he's our own. Her cousin is all too willing to help them get his child when they fill him in on the developing plan. He knew that if they got the baby, then he would have an opportunity to be in that child's life too. So they all have different motivations, but they all want the same thing. All right, let's do this. Let's and there's no time like the present. Two hours after sundown, across town, Laverne's ex has just put two of her kids, 10-year-old Samantha and 7-year-old Joshua, to bed. Two-year-old Malcolm is still up and about. She had fed her kids, and she's getting ready to turn in for the night when Fidel, Annette, and Laverne arrive. Just be a nice man, all right? <laughs> hey, hey, girl. Hey, Malcolm. Deborah's surprised to see them. After Annette explains that she wants to catch up while Laverne visits with his son, she lets them in. She let them in the house because Annette was there. Uh, here's another woman, perhaps, who would protect her, uh, someone who she didn't fear. They weren't the best of friends, but there was no reason to think that there would be any skullduggery. After all, there is safety in numbers. They enter. Uh, Fidel and Laverne, they are sitting on a couch. Annette and Deborah has struck up a conversation, and they're talking to each other. Annette looks at Deborah's overdue belly as if she's studying her. Everything she wants for their future is right there in front of her. It's around the corner. Sure. Annette went to the bathroom. Then the men jump into action. After Laverne puts his young son in a chair across the room, Fidel shoots Deborah twice in the head. When she returned, she saw Fidel holding a handgun and Laverne on top of Deborah stabbing her repeatedly in the neck. As Deborah lay dying in a growing pool of blood, they know it's now or never. Fidel begins to cut open Deborah's stomach. He removes the fetus. Annette's medical skills kick in. She removes the fetus from Fidel's hand. She breathes through the fetus's nose. She, she breathes through the mouth. And the baby begins to cry. <laughs> and now she feels she and Fidel have their child. There was blood everywhere. There was a dead body lying on the floor. But yet, through it all, Annette was happy. She was holding this baby that she believed in her mind was hers. She was. She was literally holding her future in her arms, her future with Fidel, being able to finally give him what he wanted and what she wanted. Annette stays with the baby while Fidel and Laverne search the house, looking for Deborah's other kids. They first run into Samantha. She was terrified, and they knew that they had a witness that they had to get rid of, and so they decided at that moment to kill Samantha. They stabbed her to death. This young child not being able to defend herself, listening to her mother being killed, this is just senseless. After leaving Samantha dead in her room, the killers graze past Laverne's son, Malcolm. They leave him on the floor, just a few feet away from his mother's mangled body. It appears that they let Malcolm live, perhaps because Laverne wasn't willing to cross that final line in taking the life of his own son. They're all ready to flee the bloodbath until one more problem appears before them. There's another person in the house. It's seven-year-old Joshua. And he's seen everything. He was actually running away because he was afraid. He thought that they had left already. He's frightened and scared, and he runs right into the people who are responsible for killing his mother. The silence is piercing as the three look at each other, unsure what to do with the boy. He was the proof that they had been in that home. Now they must decide what's next. What do we do with little Joshua? And later, in Wheaton, Illinois, Krista Donahoe will take the game too far when she agrees to be a pawn in her boyfriend's scheme. Krista wanted to prove to Demetrius that she was a ride or die. Krista was the bait, and Demetrius was waiting to catch their target. Annette Williams and her boyfriend, Fidel Caffey, have just murdered Laverne's pregnant ex-girlfriend and her 10-year-old daughter. 
and are about to flee with the newborn baby. But on the way out, they run into seven-year-old Joshua, who's come out from hiding too soon. He thought that they had left already. He's frightened and scared. The three of them decide they will take Joshua with them and along the way, figure out what they can do with him. As terrible as the events had become, she needed more time to think about what to do. She just was not, at that point, willing to have that trigger pulled to take a life, especially since she was holding on to a newborn life. They bring Joshua to Annette's friend Sarah Hemming's house for the night to buy them some time. Annette tells Sarah that Joshua's mother was shot in a drug-related incident and that they will be back in the morning to pick him up. And she leaves Joshua with them, and they put Joshua to bed. 30 minutes later, Annette rocks the newborn to sleep while Deborah's current boyfriend comes home to a scene from hell. Two-year-old Malcolm is crawling in a pool of blood next to his mother's dead body. In the bedroom, he discovers the harrowing fate of 10-year-old Samantha. Panicked, he keeps searching the house. Joshua is missing, nowhere to be found, and he calls the police. Law enforcement immediately sound off a race against the clock to find the missing boy alive. So they began to put out images of Joshua in the media, hoping that if anyone saw him, that they would come forward. As the sun rises, Annette goes to pick up Joshua from her friend's house, where she is immediately confronted. The boy has been up for hours talking about his terrifying recount of the night before. Annette assures Sarah that this isn't true and that, you know, it, she would take care of this. And now Annette is really beginning to think we have another witness here. They can identify us. And now something needs to happen. She convinces Sarah to come with her and the little boy back to her place, where she has some gifts to give her. When the three arrive, Annette tells her boyfriend that the boy has been talking. He directs her to keep them in the garage, where he'll put an end to the threat. Sarah is in the front seat of the car and can feel Joshua kicking against the back of the seat. Fidel turns to her and says, if you continue screaming, I will kill your entire family. Before long, Joshua stops kicking. Despite the unthinkable horror, the last witness keeps quiet for a chance at surviving. So now they have an innocent seven-year-old boy, and they wrap his body in a sheet and dump him in an alley in a suburb. So after they get rid of Joshua's body, they take Sarah back home. They allow her to live. They believe that because she's so frightened, she'll never tell anyone. But Sarah's discretion isn't enough to hide their savagery. Sarah's boyfriend was watching the news, and he sees Joshua's picture come across the screen. So although Sarah had promised she would never tell what she had witnessed, her boyfriend called the police and reported that he had seen this child and he knew who he was. For investigators working around the clock, his tip leads to a big break in the case. They waste no time bringing Sarah in for questioning. She evades all charges when she agrees to testify. Sarah told police that she witnessed Fidel kill Joshua, how they wrapped his body, how they dumped him in the alley. She also took the police directly to where the body was found. You just left them there. Before the interview is over, a team is already on their way to Annette and Fidel's house with an arrest warrant and the hope to find the newborn alive. They have the baby. The baby is healthy and cared for. When the police officers attempt to take the baby from Annette, she gets hysterical. She just gets really upset. And she's constantly saying, that's my baby. That's my baby. <laughs> but her cries are ignored. Both Annette Williams and Fidel Caffey are arrested and charged with first degree murder and kidnapping. Later that day, Laverne Ward is also arrested at his home and charged with first-degree murder. When Annette was arrested, she basically told the police everything. She walked the police step by step through everything that each one of them had done. In a very skewed, very bizarre way, uh, Annette felt that 
by telling this story, it would sort of normalize the situation that she was doing all of these noble things uh, for her guy, that she was taking care of a baby, she was bringing a life into the world, that she was establishing a family. All three are found guilty. Annette and Fidel both received the death penalty. Laverne receives life in prison, but no amount of time behind bars will ever change the deadly trail they left behind. There's Deborah, who was brutally killed. There's Joshua, who was brutally killed. There's his sister, Samantha, who was brutally killed. But there's also the two survivors, the baby that Annette took from Deborah and the two-year-old, Laverne's son, who survived this ordeal. Annette's children also lost their mother when she committed this crime. Annette already had children of her own some of them close to the age of the one that they killed. It doesn't make sense. But there are some women out there who will do anything for their man. Annette Williams tears apart countless lives to see her man live out his dream. Four hours south, in a small Illinois suburb, Krista Donahoe roots out the ultimate hustle to move up in love. For Krista Donahoe, childhood isn't all fun and games in Wayne County, Illinois. I think she lacked a lot of advantages in life that some other people may have had. I think that poverty was probably a pretty prevalent factor in, in her upbringing. Krista started building a wall very early with her parents who tried to give her everything, but it was never enough. And that resentment and that anger ended up with her acting out. As a teenager, she marches to the beat of her own drum. She was a party girl. She wanted to live out loud, be rebellious. She wanted to be recognized for living her own life, making her own choices, no matter if those choices were good or bad. Still living under her mom's roof at age 20, the fast life has done nothing but slow her down. She lacked any support to give her direction. She did not have a lot of ambitions like further education or employment or starting a family or any of those types of things. Tensions were high with Christian and her parents. She was able-bodied. She could have gotten a job, but that's not what she chose to do. But she still likes to party. And when she least expects it, she's blindsided by love in the form of 28-year-old Demetrius Cole. The night that Krista met Demetrius, it was like a moth to a flame. She was highly attracted to him. <laughs> he easily persuades her to talk to him. The conversation comes naturally. I don't know, I was supposed to go meet some friends at a party. You wanna come? She was trying to rebel. She was trying to rebel against her parents. She was trying to rebel against society. And Demetrius would stand out to her as someone who represented all those things that, that she believed she wanted. In Demetrius, she found someone who she felt could understand the kind of pain that she was in. She felt that they were both behind the eight ball, but they were behind that eight ball together. As he chats her up, she finds out he lives 40 minutes away in a town called Mount Vernon. Demetrius grew up in a very impoverished uh, part of Mount Vernon. It lent itself to drug trafficking, to violence, and to being able to make a dollar on the streets. As the hours pass, he reveals his villainous background, including convictions for drug distribution, and admits the illegal income he still lives off of. She learned that he was an ex-con. But she didn't care, because they were reflections of one another. They didn't fit in. They didn't want to conform. The two are smitten. Demetrius saw Krista as a younger version of himself. You know, she's a bad girl. She's seven years his junior, so he could mold her. The more Krista learns about the charismatic hustler, she can't resist going home with him, where she spends the better part of the next few weeks. Demetrius and Krista started dating just like any hot and heavy romance. They just went full in. She stayed over at his house all the time. They were always together. They were inseparable. After three months, home is where her man is, and there's nothing her parents can do about it. She moved in with Demetrius's mom in her basement. So it was Krista, Demetrius, and Demetrius's half-brother, Christopher, all in one space. 
Even though they live rent-free, the struggle to make ends meet becomes increasingly dire by the day. When Demetrius's illicit income falls short, he blames Krista for their financial hardships. I do something. No matter what Demetrius did to Krista, she loved him the same. He could yell at her, he could make her feel awful, but her love for him was unwavering. But soon, a treacherous plan challenges Krista in a twisted game of proving her worth. Demetrius Cole is a dangerous person to have appear in your life. Krista wanted to prove to Demetrius that she was a ride or die, and that she had something to offer. She was valuable by any means necessary. She wanted to be his woman. Yo, you just shot him! In Mount Vernon, Illinois, Krista Donahoe and her boyfriend, Demetrius Cole, are unemployed and living in his mother's basement with his brother. But familiarity breeds contempt, and three months later, Demetrius threatens to kick her out if she doesn't start pulling her weight financially. She wasn't about to lose him, because in her mind, this is the only person who not only would she be able to connect with or was connecting with, but was the only person who understood her unique needs and she understood his. Krista and Demetrius were barely able to make ends meet. They didn't have any money, nobody had a job, so tensions were really high and they really needed a break. Get, my nerves. Get, my nerves. Get, so get out of my face! And Go. they're about to get one. On a hot summer afternoon, Krista goes on a beer run. She parks the car outside a liquor store next to 52-year-old Randy Farrar. Randy was a successful businessman. His family made money in the oil business, but on his own right, he was wealthy and successful in the real estate industry as well. As she gets out of the car, Randy slowly approaches. And Krista lied about her name. She called herself Susan. And he doesn't beat around the bush. Randy told Krista he was attracted to her. He offered to take her out to dinner to let her know that he actually had some money. He was willing to spend on her. Randy provided $5 to Kristen at that time to purchase cigarettes. And he also left her his card with his phone number on it. She saw dollar signs. She saw money. She saw opportunity. And he was an easy target. She can't get home fast enough with the news. Krista told him that she had met this man who appeared to have some money, drove a nice car, and was willing to take her out to dinner and wanted to take her to his home somewhere out in the country. So this is an opportunity for Krista and Demetrius to potentially come up with some money. To bring Randy into the picture just only solidified that she had something to offer Demetrius, because in her mind, Demetrius had everything to offer her. And here is a way for Krista to contribute to the household. Business card, I gave him my number, okay. like, I just think this could work. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's yeah. what I'm talking about. Just as she hoped, Demetrius is impressed that she had enough game to lure the man in. In many ways, she felt very validated in her relationship with Demetrius because now she could be useful to him. It built up who she was. It really empowered her to see herself as being useful in this relationship. As she continues her exciting story of impending wealth, he can't get enough. Demetrius saw this as his moment to come up. He didn't have consistent income. This was a way to get big money real quick. Demetrius encouraged Krista to develop the relationship with Randy, and Randy was going to be the solution to their money problems. Call him. Yeah, let's get this dude. Okay. Yeah, come in. Come yeah, I'm proud of you. That's what I'm talking about. Come on, come on. <laughs> Less than 24 hours later, Demetrius instructs Krista to pick up the phone and start buttering up their golden goose. Demetrius was supportive of this, that he wanted her to continue to talk to him on the phone, to go out and meet him for dinner and to see where they could take this. I just wanted to see how you were. Cheers. Two days later, Krista knows she's got him in the palm of her hand. It was flirtatious. Everything indicated that a sexual relationship was what he was after. And he's ready to use anything in his personal arsenal to get it. He then started talking about uh, his property and things that he owned, different uh, things of that nature. Made it, made it clear to Krista that he had money and had some means. 
After their date, Randy was hooked on Krista. And Krista was hooked on Randy as far as dollar signs. He had money to spend, and he wanted to spend it on her. And she was going to let him. Krista leaves the dinner table that night with an invitation to come to Randy's home the following night. To Demetrius, this is his cue to step in. When Randy invited Krista to his house, it was a no-brainer. It was going to happen. Somebody was going to get paid. The next day, Demetrius plans their action for sundown. Krista will act as the bait to distract Randy, and with the help of his brother, they'll rob his house blind. Christopher was taken along uh, primarily for muscle, for the backup. Why not make sure you have the advantage when it comes to committing the offense? But Krista will find out that Demetrius is plotting something even more sinister than she could ever imagine. It opened her up to a realm of adventure that she didn't really realize that she was getting herself into. There was nothing she would not do for him. Desperate for cash, Mount Vernon, Illinois couple Krista Donahoe and her boyfriend Demetrius Cole think they found a rich opportunity in wealthy businessman Randy Farrar. He had money to spend and he wanted to spend it on her and she was gonna let him. When Randy invited Krista to his house, a plan was hatched. Krista will be the person who goes into the house and provides the distraction for Randy, presumably engaging in some sexual conduct with him while Demetrius and his brother Christopher commit the robbery. And as they wait out the day until Krista's date, Christopher finds a distraction with 16-year-old neighbor Jenny Archer. Jenny comes walking down the street, and because Christopher is a ladies' man, she was attracted to him and vice versa. And they just all four started hanging out. It was like an instant friendship. The decision to go to Randy's house has already been made, and they asked Jenny to join them. And they all knew the plan except for Jenny. Leading the teen to believe they had a pit stop to make on the way to a party, she's down to go along for the ride. Just before sunset, the crew piles into Christopher's car, eager to make their move. Randy lived about 15, 20 minutes outside of Mount Vernon. Large homes, a lot of privacy. Neighbors were spread far apart. Big lawns. It was a beautiful neighborhood. Shortly after dark, the foursome pulls up to the side of the house. They wait in the car until Krista nervously greets Randy at the door. Right this way. Krista slowly lures their target while the brothers quietly get out of the car. They're looking to make sure that nobody's around, that there are no surveillance videos or cameras around. When Jenny agrees to wait in the car, they start moving closer to the house. Inside, Krista is holding up her end of the plan. So Krista enters the house, immediately engages in some romantic contact with, uh, with Randy, thereby ensuring that the door will remain unlocked. In her mind, she knew that she couldn't turn back. She had to help hatch that plan. She was now in the middle of it, and she needed to show Demetrius that she could do this. So Demetrius and Christopher entered the unlocked door that Krista left open for them. They continue to observe the scene, case the inside of the house, um, without being seen by Randy. He screamed, and they started beating him. They hit him, kicked him. And as Randy's getting viciously attacked, Krista is looking for valuables, things that she could take. In between blows, they stop to question him. He's too weak to answer, but the intruders think another round of punches will give him the strength to talk. Still unable to answer, the brothers search the bedroom where they discover an unexpected gem. Demetrius and Christopher found lots of cash and a small handgun that was Randy's. Once they found the gun, the game completely changed. They're loading the weapon and pocketing two grand in cash when Krista thinks she's found an even bigger jackpot. Krista returns to the bedroom and she announces that she's found a, a safe down in the basement. Yo, there's a safe downstairs. We gotta get it open. Man, get him, man. Uh, at that him. point in time, uh, Demetrius and Chris force Randy from the bedroom down the stairs to the basement to try to get in the safe. Open the safe. They think it, his fortune is in it. They think cash is in it. But it's a gun safe, and the 55-year-old developer would rather die than tell them how to open it. 
Randy is placed on his knees at this point in the basement, execution style, with the gun pointed at his head, and they're demanding of him to open the safe. Anxious to leave, Krista stays close to the action, while her boyfriend makes it another game of hit and tell to get the safe open. And nobody wins. He's frenetic. He's like, open the safe, open the safe. And Randy refuses. It's a moment gone wrong. And when it's all said and done, Krista is in for the shock of her life. Nobody was expecting that. She screamed. She went crazy. She didn't know what to do. Even when things went horribly wrong, she stuck by his side until the bitter end. In Mount Vernon, Illinois, Krista Donahoe, her boyfriend Demetrius Cole, and his brother Christopher Watkins are in the middle of robbing 55-year-old Randy Farrar when their scheme derails. When Demetrius found the gun, it was a plan gone bad. He was the person who could tell the police who it was who had done these horrible things, who had committed this robbery. Demetrius raises his hand and shoots Randy twice in the head and kills him. As Randy's body falls to the floor, Krista does too. When Demetrius shot and killed Randy, Krista lost it. She didn't know what to do. They didn't go out there shooting. They went out there to rob him, and Demetrius pushed it over the edge. Perhaps she was numb. Perhaps she was in shock. It was apparent that her boyfriend was, in fact, a cold-blooded killer. But still, she loved him. Still, she would try to protect him. Thunderstruck, the three can think of nothing but getting out of there. And they went around the house trying to gather everything that they touched, things they thought their prints were on. They tried to confiscate it. They run to the car where they remember Jenny's been waiting for the last 20 minutes. Having heard the gunshot, the teen is too afraid to ask what happened, and the crew offers no explanation. So they return back to Mount Vernon, and the first thing they do is they come back into town and they get gas. And we believe that at this point in time that some evidence was dumped into the trash can. They dropped Jenny off with $200 to forget they went to Randy's property that night. As the sun rises that same morning, Demetrius and Krista pay cash for a bus ticket to St. Louis, four hours away after Christopher insisted on staying home. Demetrius, Cole, and Krista go on the lam at this point. They figure that they can blend into the neighborhoods in St. Louis and larger community. They stayed in a motel in North St. Louis City, and they just tried to lay low until things blew over. Over the next four days, Randy remains untouched in his basement until his assistant goes to check on things and ends up following a bloody trail to his body. She calls police, who soon swarm the crime scene with investigators. After interviewing a list of usual suspects, police catch their big break in the case. We had no leads until we start hearing a little bit of whispering on the streets of Mount Vernon about a girl named Jenny who had possibly been present when Randy Farrar was killed. We then talk to and interview Jenny, who agrees to cooperate with us. And what exactly were you doing that night with these people? We all just got in the car, and we were riding around, and we pulled up to this huge house. She knew where they lived and their first names. And in exchange for her testimony, Jenny avoids all charges. At about the same time, Christopher just appears at the sheriff's office, wants to talk to us about what happened to uh, Randy Farrar. Hoping to minimize his charges, Christopher gives police the whole story, emphasizing that his brother was the one who pulled the trigger. The case took a major change once investigators got with Christopher Watkins. He spilled all the beans. He told them everything from beginning to end. He told everything, everybody who was involved. And not only that, he tells police where his brother and Krista escaped to the day after the murder. We then contacted uh, the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department and began working with them, uh, locating different places he could have stayed and began searching through those places. As police write their names down, the wanted couple are still laying low, living off of Randy's money. It takes four months, but the St. Louis Police Department finally gets a tip that their suspects are out in the open near a motel. Demetrius and Krista were located in the north side of St. Louis, uh, Missouri. Under questioning, uh, neither Demetrius Cole or Krista Donahoe would uh, speak with us. They both requested attorneys. 
Krista Donahoe and Demetrius Cole are tried for first-degree murder and robbery. Before Randy's grieving family, neither Krista or Demetrius show remorse at their trials. Demetrius receives 52 years in prison, and Krista receives 45 years. Christopher Watkins is also tried and found guilty of first-degree murder and is sentenced to 45 years in prison. As the books close on a senseless murder, Krista's love story is put to an end. This is a classic case of eyes wide shut, and she knew what was going on, but yet she was allowing this to happen, allowing it to play out to the point of where her physical freedom would be gone. She did this all for the love of Demetrius. She did this all for the love of her man. Falling in love with Demetrius Cole and seeking to make him love her back the same way that she loved him was the biggest mistake she made. It's just unfortunate that when you rebel in such a way, you can't recover. And in Houston, Texas. He was cute, he was young, he was just what she was looking for. And her desire to keep him will drive her to the extreme. Verna's gonna get whatever she wants, even if someone has to die. Verna did all of this for one reason, and that was to keep a man in her life. And later in Florida, Shakita Jones falls hard for a sweet-talking Romeo. Jesse was this guy who seemed to be what any young woman would desire. Whose out-of-control drug habit forces her into a life of crime. Miss Jones brought a gunman, violence, and greed to that gas station. She knew that somebody was going to be robbed. Shakita Jones did what her boyfriend wanted. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. As a young child growing up in a single-parent home in Oakland, California, Verna McLean always felt that she could lean on her mother. Her mom was the one that was the role model in her life. Her mom was the main focus of her life. They were very close. But when Verna's mother and sister leave her behind to move to Houston, Texas, the now 23-year-old is fine with it. She's fallen for a man named Theo McLean, who whisks her away to San Diego, where for the next four years, she splits her time between raising children and being a nurse. This woman was a nurse, so the, her job was to take care of people professionally, but she also took care of them personally, too. Uh, so certainly, uh, this was someone who was giving, who was caring, who was a healer, really the salt of the earth. And now, several years later, the 27-year-old's patience is wearing thin. She was working over 60 hours a week. She worked in nursing homes. She worked in child care facilities. The people that she worked with, everybody had great things to say about her. But as much as Verna lives for taking care of people, her long hours are not born from a love of her job, but more out of necessity. Her husband did not have a job. She was the breadwinner for the family. She had three children. She was the only one responsible for the kids. Without a doubt, she was tired of doing all of that. One summer day, Verna reaches her breaking point and decides it's time for a change. I'm out of here. I can't live like this, and neither is my child. She Bye. tells her husband she's taking the kids to visit her mother and sister in Houston, Texas, and never looks back. Verna may have decided to move looking for a better life moving to a new city where perhaps she could meet new people and find the love of her life. By all accounts, Verna was a very responsible person and a very nurturing person. When Verna moved to Texas, this was an opportunity to completely reinvent herself. After setting herself and her kids up in her mother's home, Verna lands a job with a home health care service. She ended up eventually working for a company that treated or cared for high-risk children. Once Verna is settled in Houston, the scenery isn't the only thing that changes. A new city means it's also time for a new Verna. Long gone is the plain Jane nurse who lived for others. You saw her become someone that she wasn't in San Diego. Makeup always done, hair always done. She started wearing wigs constantly. She became somebody she thought she wanted to be. This was an opportunity to reinvent herself, to be what she always had wanted to be, this exciting woman 
known for her looks, known for her beauty. And so she did everything in her power to create that image. For the first time in her adult life, Verna isn't tied down to one man. So she plays the field with men she meets online, using them to fulfill her most basic desires. Perhaps one man provided what she needed sexually. Perhaps another man provided what she needed romantically. That allowed her to kind of become the Verna that she wanted to be. Verna is soul searching. Her father wasn't there. Her own home was broken in that her husband wasn't there for her emotionally. This is a woman who is searching for validation. Despite her appetite for online dating, it's her work as a nurse that leads Verna to Andrew Manor, a handsome mama's boy with a heart of gold. Andrew's niece had a trach in her throat. She had a problem where Verna had to take care of her. Andrew was about 10 years younger than Verna. He was in his early 20s. Verna's job puts her in Andrew's home all day, every day. And it's hard for her not to get enveloped into the close-knit family. Andrew lived with his mom, lived with his brother. And that relationship kind of developed not only with Andrew, but with Andrew's mother. Almost immediately, Verna and Andrew take their attraction to the next level. Verna was attracted to Andrew because he was much younger, he was impressionable, um, he was a good guy, that he could be easily controlled by Verna, uh, who was much more mature and knew the ways of the world. I think that what Verna saw in Andrew was someone who made her feel different than she felt when she was in San Diego, someone who made her feel more like a woman. Verna also has the love and approval of Andrew's mother. She's found stability. Things are going well with her family. Things are going well with Andrew and uh, his mother. is showering her with affection. She feels special. She feels great. And she's not going to let anything come in the way of where she is right now, in the way of this happiness. Nothing. But having all of her needs met isn't enough for Verna. She's worried that she might lose Andrew to a more desirable woman, one who's closer to his own age. She needs to ensure Andrew will be in her life forever. So she decides to tell him she's carrying his child. Andrew was very excited to be a father. He was happy about it. it speaks about pure emotion and desperation and doing whatever you have to do in order to keep your relationship alive. Verna may have known enough about Andrew to know that if she told him she was pregnant, that he would stick around. What Andrew doesn't know is that Verna is unable to give birth. After the birth of Verna's third child, she got her tubes tied. She couldn't be pregnant, but that didn't stop her from saying that she was pregnant. With a nine-month deadline in place, Verna must come up with a plan to ensure her future with the man she loves or lose him forever. When I think about what Verna McLean did, it haunts me to this day. Verna was about to step out of her body for this man. It was scary what she did for him. In Houston, Texas, Verna McLean is so enamored with her young paramour that she tells him she's pregnant, even though she is unable to have children after a previous surgery. The reason she couldn't get out of the lie with Andrew was because she got her tubes tied. But Andrew starts talking marriage. Andrew's this expecting to have a new son or daughter and was very excited about it. Here's a situation. He has a stable woman, stable relationship, and he has a child that's on the way. And so it was easy for him to feed in to all of the lies he was being fed by Verna, even if they were ridiculous lies. He's also excited to share the news with the other woman in his life. Andrew's mom and Andrew, they were so excited that they were going to have a baby with her and be a dad and be a grandma. As the months progress, Verna continues to lie about her pregnancy. And Andrew and his mother fall for it hook, line, and sinker. Verna would have been able to pull this off because she's a nurse, so she knows what's involved in being pregnant, and she's also a mother. 
Verna had a heavier body built, so it would have made it easier for her to lie about the pregnancy. She doesn't tell her own family about Andrew, so that she doesn't have to worry about perpetuating the lie at home. It's obvious that Verna uh, portrayed herself differently to different people and certainly compartmentalized uh, various aspects of her life. She just didn't want the worlds to collide. Around three months in, Verna's able to keep the deception going as far as Andrew is concerned. But as another woman who's given birth, fooling Andrew's mother isn't as easy. Verna's future mother-in-law was questioning Verna about why Andrew or Andrew's mother couldn't go to Verna's doctor's appointments related to the pregnancy. As she nears her fictitious second trimester, Verna tells Andrew and his mother that she's learned her pregnancies at risk and she must travel an hour southeast to Galveston to see a specialist. The latest ruse keeps them at bay for now. Andrew didn't have a car. He had no way to get down there. His mom worked at the post office and was working all the time. With each passing day bringing her closer to the nine-month mark, Verna finds herself at the point of no return. It was easier for her at that point to just continue to say that I'm pregnant, and eventually she would figure something out. If Verna faked a miscarriage for Andrew, then she was afraid that she just might lose him forever. In addition to losing Andrew, she's also at risk for losing her job as a home care nurse. Verna has painted herself into a corner, and she sees only one way out. She knew that she had to produce a baby to show Andrew. The only thing that came into her mind was to kidnap a child. She comes up with a plan and sets it in motion. First, Verna comes up with a story to tell her own family to explain why she may soon be coming home with a child. Her family believed that any moment that Verna could become an emergency foster parent for a, a foster child. And it made complete sense. Verna was a nurse. Verna took care of children. And so nobody really ever questioned it. Then, with only a week to go before the nine-month mark, Verna calls Andrew from her home in Houston to tell him she's in Galveston and has unexpectedly given birth to their child knowing he will be unable to get down there right away. She started sending him pictures of different children on Facebook. He was getting photographs of kids that he thought was his own little baby. The photos do the trick, and Andrew promises to be patient until she and their child are discharged in a few days. The love and the adoration that Andrew and his mother gave to Verna because they believed she was pregnant only fed her ego and only kept the lie going. But Verna knows she's only bought herself so much time. She needs a baby, and she doesn't care who she has to harm to get one. She goes and gets a gun. She goes and gets the bullets. Verna did all of this for one reason, and that was to keep a man in her life. And later, in Lake City, South Carolina, Shakita Jones puts her man's needs before her own, with fatal effects. Verna McLean's hot young boyfriend thinks she's just given birth to their son in Galveston. But she doesn't have a baby to show for it, and now she must kidnap one. She had a goal in mind, and she was going to accomplish that goal, whatever it took. And it takes getting a gun. To get a gun in Texas, all you have to do is have a clean record. They do a background check on you, um, fill out an application, and purchase the gun. With her own car prone to breakdowns, Verna borrows her sister's car and drives to a pediatric clinic less than two miles from her sister's apartment in Houston. It's a standalone location. It's not going to have the same safety standards as a hospital. It's going to be much easier to kidnap a child in the parking lot of a pediatric clinic than it is to whisk a baby away from a hospital. Verna waits for hours, hoping someone shows up at the clinic with a newborn who fits the bill. As Verna was sitting there watching these moms go back and forth, she had plenty of time to rethink this, to do something else. But I think she was just feeling so desperate that she had to do it. Verna's patience pays off when she sees a young Caucasian woman pull up in a pickup truck. She was trying to pass off the baby as someone who could be Andrew's baby. 
and so a white baby. Kayla Golden Shookhart is at the clinic for a postnatal checkup with her three-day-old son, Keegan. Kayla was a 28-year-old mother of three. She was a stay-at-home mom. She and her husband, Kevin, had been married for about three years. Unfortunately for Kayla, she's walked into a hornet's nest. And it was at that point that Verna knew exactly what she wanted and exactly who she needed to get it from. Verna pulls into the empty parking space next to Kayla's and waits for her to return from her appointment. A little over an hour later, Kayla exits the clinic with Keegan. Kayla's making her way to the pickup truck. When Verna sees Kayla, she's probably thinking it's now or never. Verna rolled down the window, put her arm out. Kayla never saw Verna McLean. As Kayla's putting her child in the car seat, she's shot in the back seven times. But despite being mortally wounded, Kayla's not giving up her baby without a fight. What you have is Verna taking baby Keegan, getting in the vehicle, and then Kayla kind of struggling with her, still trying to get the baby as she falls to the side. Verna speeds off and heads toward her sister's apartment. For Verna to kill Kayla in broad daylight and snatch that baby, it speaks about being totally emotional to the point of pure desperation. 911 is flooded with calls from eyewitnesses to the crime as bystanders rush to Kayla's side. Kayla was still alive when EMS responded and when law enforcement got there. When she was telling the paramedics, other first responders, was what her baby was wearing. Her main concern was getting her baby back. Kayla is loaded into an ambulance, but loses consciousness and slips away en route to the hospital. She died protecting her kid. And that stuck with me then, it sticks with me now. At the scene, concerned citizens provide the police with crucial details about the attack. There were a lot of uh, witnesses that were able to give us a description of the vehicle, and I believe of a license plate as well. Law enforcement issues a be on the lookout for the car and plates described. Meanwhile, Verna stops at her sister's house to drop off the car and change out of her blood-spattered clothes. Then she calls Andrew's mother. Verna called her and said, hey, um, I've got the baby. I'm in town. I need you to take me over to my mom's house. I'm at my sister's house. And so um, Andrew's mom wanted to see the baby and obliged. Andrew's mother picks up Verna and her new grandson, unaware of the brutal murder and kidnapping that occurred just a few miles away. And of course, Andrew's mother is so focused on the baby that she's completely oblivious to any nervousness that's coming from Verna. Verna doesn't know that the local police have found her sister's car. It was by complete happenstance. They're driving around looking, patrolling the area. They drive into this complex and decide to go down this perfect aisle and happen to see the Lexus. The hood on the vehicle was still warm. The blood is smeared all over on the side. Surrounded by doting grandmas at her mom's house, Verna has a moment of clarity and realizes by fleeing her sisters so fast, she's neglected to cover her tracks. She's left the car with blood all over it, all the bloody clothes, the gun, her bloody cell phone, in her sister's apartment. And so it's at that point she goes to the scene. But it's too late. Verna arrives to find the apartment complex swarming with law enforcement. Verna came to the scene there saying she had heard about it on TV. And it's not the first time that a suspect would come back to the scene of the crime. It's almost cliche. Verna tells police she knows nothing of the abduction, but happened to find a baby on the steps of the apartment complex earlier that day. She took the baby to her mom's house until she could call authorities. But police know it's a tall tale. Verna's story is not making sense because we obviously know that the child wasn't found on the steps, that the child's mother had been murdered. Police at this point have identified that vehicle that Verna used that had blood all over it, that had shell casings laying in the floorboard of the car. As detectives on scene continue to talk to Verna, law enforcement are dispatched to her mother's house. They go to the house, the Texas Rangers make entry into the home, and they find Kayla's child there. The moment detectives at the apartment complex get word of baby Keegan's safe recovery, Verna's arrested for the kidnapping of three-day-old Keegan Shukart and the first-degree murder of his mother, Kayla. 
The tragic part of this situation is that Kayla died not knowing whether or not her child was still alive, whether or not her child had been found. Later that night, Andrew finds out what happened while watching the news. He rushes down to the jail to be by Verna's side. For Andrew and his mother, this was an enormous betrayal because here was a woman that they trusted more than anything, that they treated like a queen, and to find out that she was a liar, she was a killer. But despite the earth-shattering revelation, as Verna awaits her day in court, Andrew stands by his woman. He still loved her. In his mind, he felt that she had murdered someone for him, that this whole thing was because of him. She did this for him. It's fascinating how Verna uh, just had a change of heart. Um, here she did all of these things for Andrew in her mind uh, in order to please him. But at the end of the day, she now feels less than zero for him. Even with his unconditional support, Verna lets Andrew go forever. He came to the jail and visited her and talked to her for about a month. And after that, she cut off all ties with him. It's really amazing how Verna's mind just flipped from really admiring and loving Andrew to not even caring about him and even kicking herself for doing something so horrific for his love. Facing the death penalty, Verna takes a deal and pleads guilty in exchange for a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. Verna McLean decided to accept responsibility. She's never gonna get out. But accepting responsibility in court and admitting it to herself are two entirely different things. I don't know if Verna really saw beyond getting the baby. If she really saw, how am I going to pass this baby on as mine? Andrew and his mother so trusted Verna and to find out that she actually took another woman's life and tried to snatch a child must have been a situation where they were completely disillusioned. And how could they ever trust anyone like that again after the trust that they put into Verna? Verna McLean was willing to do anything to keep her man, even if it meant taking someone else's life and kidnapping their baby. On the East Coast, Shakita Jones' desire for love will lead to deadly consequences. In Lake City, South Carolina, a young Shakita grows up on the wrong side of the tracks. In that particular county where she was raised, you had neighborhoods that were really plagued with poverty and crime and things of that sort. The reality of her surroundings does not bring the young teen down. I think Shakita had that dream of wanting to be that individual that was a success. Her parents were not married. She was raised in a household with her grandmother and her mother. The opposite sex starts taking notice when she's just a teen. Shakita learned how to use what assets she knew to manage early on. She was looking for attention, and it seemed like she used sex in order to get it. Sex for Shakita served two purposes. For one, she grew up in an all-female home, and it provided her validation. And secondly, and more importantly, it was a real escape for her. An escape Shakita indulges in all too often. And as she exits her teen years and enters adulthood, her dreams of getting out are dashed. And so she ended up having three children by the age of 25, by three different males. Shakita and her three children share a cramped home with her mother and grandmother. Shakita didn't have a lot of funds, and therefore she was living under the support of the welfare system and also social services. Money was a major concern. As a single parent with any number of children, having to work and care for them at the same time, that that would be tough. Unfortunately, when we look at this cycle of poverty, it happens all too much. In some neighborhoods, we see that with poverty, there is a lack of opportunity, a lack of education. So youngsters become involved 
uh, insects and other aimless sorts of activities, which then further drives them back into that cycle of poverty. However, Shakita's circumstances are about to change with the arrival of a smooth-talking Romeo who promises to make all her dreams come true. I think it's fair to say that she was desperate. She loved him to the point where she was willing to do anything he wanted. In the small town of Lake City, South Carolina, 28-year-old Shakita Jones seems destined to live a life of limited means. She so desperately wanted to get out of poverty. She didn't want to live in a household with her mother, her grandmother, and her three children. Money isn't the only thing missing from Shakita's life. She wanted and was in search of love and that desire to be respected. One of the few bright spots is Sunday worship with her grandmother. When you have very little in this life, when there are things that are not physically tangible for you, this is where faith steps in. She didn't have satisfaction in her relationships. She didn't have the things that perhaps we all strive for in order to be comfortable. But one thing she had was her faith. And she showed that by attending church with her grandmother. And it's at church one day where Shakita meets the handsome Jesse Cooper. He comes into the church. In her eyes, it was like love at first sight. He stood out, gold teeth, a beautiful smile. She's drawn into Jesse because he is the picture of success. Uh, he appears to be the guy that she always dreamt and fantasized about, the one who's going to lift her out of her poverty, out of her humdrum life, and carry her uh, into the sunset with pure happiness. In town to visit his grandparents, Jesse tells Shakita he's a hip hop producer back in his hometown of Jacksonville, Florida. He claimed to be really high in the industry and working with numerous artists, and he had everything to prove that this was the case. Really long gold chains, nice sneakers, a really nice SUV with shiny rims. But what Shakita doesn't know is that this choir boy carries a very dark tune. He's a cocaine user. Jesse Cooper had a long criminal history, and there was no evidence that he ever held a stable job. Jesse was dealing with Grand Theft Auto. And if you know about the video game, it's definitely not something that you want to play with. For the next month, Jesse turns on the charm, romancing Shakita while keeping his drug habit and illicit money-making activities in check. Jesse treated Shakita very well. Everything that she desired, he got for her. He was very nice to her three children. He was respectful to her. It was everything that she wanted. She was living on cloud nine. And when after a month, Jesse has to go back home to Jacksonville, Shakita's heartbroken. The two stay in touch over the phone, and it doesn't take long for Shakita to take stock of her life, which now seems even less satisfying than before. She thinks about it a little bit, stays in this same crowded home, and then decides after about four weeks, I'm out of here. Driven by her desire, Shakita loads the kids up and heads 300 miles south to Jacksonville. Everything seemed to be perfect in her eyes. She's with the individual that she met in church, that she loved. It was great. Once she arrives, Jesse welcomes Shakita with open arms. Jesse feels great. There's no doubt in Jesse's mind that she was going to come. It just was a matter of time. And so a month later, she's there. That is, until Jesse's drug use comes to light. What is this? And when the mother of three learns he's not really a hip hop producer, she makes a surprising decision. Shakita was not going to go back to the community she came from. And at that point, she decided, I'm going to support my man. In her mind, Shakita had a lot more to lose by leaving Jesse even after she found out about his cocaine habit. Uh, this is the guy who has been there with her, and so she is determined to make that relationship happen, even if it means exposing her children to a negative element. 
Shakita's found herself in a horrible situation. She has three children, and she's now living with a man that she realizes she knows nothing about. Jesse Cooper probably saw that she was somewhat vulnerable. Being a single parent, having three kids, would need somebody to support her. Not wanting to return to a life of loneliness, Shakita stays with Jesse. But after only a few weeks, when Shakita can't find a job and her welfare checks are spreading thin, the family's need for money is at a constant. Jesse comes up with a plan. With Shakita's 14-year-old daughter left at home in charge of her younger siblings, Jesse enlists Shakita to drive him around to find cars to steal and to serve as lookout while he boosts them. By Jesse introducing Shakita into his illicit uh, life of crime by stealing cars, now he has a real partner. Shakita Jones was in love with Jesse Cooper. She wanted to be a part of what he was doing. The lovers are suspected of a string of thefts in a short amount of time, creating a mini crime wave in the Jacksonville area that does not go unnoticed by authorities. They're committing these crimes all in the same community. It's but so big. So you have a precinct that identifies this is a problem in this particular area, and so they send out the authorities to start looking. Police are looking for known car thieves. Due to a past conviction for grand theft auto, Jesse becomes a prime suspect and is brought in for questioning. Jesse is aware that the officers don't have anything on him. He's aware that he's going in for questioning, and therefore he gives them what they want, and they allowed him to go home. Jesse's been down this road before, so he knows what to do. For him, it's just about deny, 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 deny. Because if they had something on him, they would have gotten him already. When Jesse finally goes home after the questioning, Shakita's excited, of course, because she just wants her man at the end of the day. But it changes a lot for them in terms of the crimes that they're committing. Shakita can't imagine life without Jesse, so she's willing to do whatever it takes to keep him out of the radar of law enforcement. With Jesse now on the police's radar, Shakita thinks it's too risky for them to keep stealing cars. If you steal a car, you have to sell the car to someone who will give you cash and someone who's also willing to take on a stolen car, knowing that we are change the license plate so you don't get arrested. Shakita's using her brain and she decides, maybe we need to change things up a bit. Shakita suggests they should go for a straight cash grab by holding up a business. When Shakita comes up with this plan, this is clear evidence to Jesse that she's fit for this lifestyle, that she's built for this. Jesse is all for it. And his approval signals the start of a chain of events that will end with one dead and the other behind bars. She wanted to prove herself. She wanted Jesse to know that she would be by his side for a lifetime. This was the beginning to a, uh, the final chapter of Shakita Jones' life. In Jacksonville, Florida, 28-year-old mother of three, Shakita Jones, has decided that the best way to support herself, her kids, and her boyfriend, Jesse Cooper, is to commit armed robbery. It's quick and easy in a way that stealing something else isn't. Shakita realizes that if she doesn't get involved in this life of crime with Jesse, that she could lose him. She can lose this dream relationship. So in her mind, she has no choice. Shakita proposes the two rob a gas station with a food mart. There's a lot more revenue that's coming there as opposed to a gas station where you're just coming in and pumping gas and leaving. And so she really had decided at that point that it was all about getting more and more money. Jesse convinces Shakita the next step is for her to canvas the area to find a gas station that looks busy enough to be worth the risk. Shakita ends up being the eyes and the ears of the streets for Jesse. He valued her as a criminal conspirator. You need to trust the people you're committing crimes with. I don't know if he loved her or if he was just using her to commit crimes, but clearly he knew her well enough to know he could trust her. 
After driving around some of Jacksonville's busiest areas, Shakita thinks she's found their target in a local gas station. This particular uh, chain of gas stations is very big in Jacksonville, so I think they had a good idea that the money drop would be a large dollar figure. For the next several days, she stakes it out from a safe distance. Shakita Jones was casing the gate gas station, parking either in or near the store, and waiting for the manager to exit the store and then following him through his rounds until he got to the bank. From this particular location, Shakita has a clear view of everything that's happening inside the gas station. But what Shakita doesn't know is while she's been watching the gas station, someone else has been watching her. There had been a rash of recent robberies at this particular gas station chain, and that's why the sheriff's office was out there in the first place surveilling the areas. Shakita was so caught up in the robbery that she was planning that she didn't realize that she stuck out like a sore thumb. She was establishing a pattern in her trying to assess the situation, monitor the situation there. After two more days of monitoring activity in and around the gas station, Shakita decides it's time. Because of the surveillances that Shakita did, she's fully aware that the store manager leaves at 10 a.m. in order to go make this big deposit. While Shakita sits in her vehicle across the street, Jesse parks in the gas station lot, out of sight from the Minimart entrance. And at the particular time, it's about 9 a.m., which means that in one hour, the store manager will be leaving with all of that cash. Jesse Cooper would be in a position hidden from the front of the store, and she would communicate by phone as to when the manager was coming out. The plan was to walk up with a gun and rob the guy in the parking lot. When Shakita finally sees the store manager coming out, she cues Jesse. Jesse hangs up the phone and makes his move as Shakita watches on. He pulled a gun on him, demanded the money, and the employee handed it over to him. Give me the bread, bro. Everything seems to go off without a hitch. After the robbery, he returned to his car, he got in, but suddenly, two unmarked police cars pull into the gas station and block Jesse. Hands up. Hands up. The police cut him off. They got out of their car. They raised firearms to him, told him to put his hands up. And rather than put his hands up, he brought up a firearm. 28-year-old single mother Shakita Jones and her boyfriend Jesse Cooper came up with what they thought was a foolproof scheme to rob a gas station in Jacksonville, Florida only to have their plan go spectacularly wrong. As he was preparing to leave the parking lot, the police cut him off. They got out of their car. They raised firearms to him, told him to put his hands up. And rather than put his hands up, he brought up a firearm. And then the police opened fire. Jesse is shot multiple times, and he dies immediately. Watching her boyfriend being gunned down by the police and knowing it was her plan, Shakita is in shock, she's in disbelief, but eventually goes into the mode of guilt. But just as she starts her car, the authorities who've been keeping an eye on her move in. Shakita is arrested without incident. When it comes time to protect her own skin, that's exactly what she does. It becomes all about her and not about Jesse. At the police station, Shakita pleads ignorance, claiming Jesse never told her he planned on robbing the gas station. Shakita can't see life without Jesse. This is something that she just can't do. So she'll do whatever it takes to make sure that she stays out of the radar of law enforcement. Shakita is indicted and not only for the robbery. In a shocking turn of events, she is also charged with the murder of Jesse Cooper. Under Florida law, if anyone dies in the commission of a crime, the people who were involved in the crime are responsible for that person's death. Therefore, prosecutors argued, she was responsible for the murder of Jesse Cooper. This has to be devastating for Shakita. The man that she loves is gunned down, uh, and it's because of a plot that she came up with, a faulty one at that. But now, law enforcement, the legal system, turns around and they charge her with the murder. So not only does she have to deal with the guilt of this personally, but also take the full brunt legally. 
Eight months after the robbery gone wrong, Shakita pleads not guilty to all counts. She takes the stand during her trial. And when questioned about a 53-minute phone conversation with Jesse in the minutes leading up to the robbery, she has an answer at the ready. She came up with an account that the reason that she and her boyfriend were on the phone was simply to have phone sex. Shakita identified that she didn't even have a clue that he was across from her or at a gas station committing or doing anything. But with law enforcement tracking Shakita's moves outside the gas station days before the robbery, the jury doesn't buy it. Shakita Jones is found guilty of armed robbery and second degree felony murder. She is sentenced to 35 years. What the court saw from her were excuses um, no reasons and a lack of sympathy for what she had done. She was responsible for someone's death. In this case, it was somebody that she knew and probably loved. Shakita loved Jesse. Jesse loved Shakita. But it was built on lies, um, not on the side of Shakita, but on the side of Jesse. And although the love was strong, it was a lie, and therefore it was bound to fail from the start. It was obviously a destructive love. We can sit here and say, what were you thinking? But she loved him, and she wanted to be with him, and she wanted to be part of his life. Unfortunately, that ended up destroying her own life. He ended up dying. She ended up being in prison. And now her life is virtually over. And the tragedy here is that her children, who are innocent, are now going to grow up without their mother Anh cóp cái mã này vào đây, nhanh lên Em kêu anh cóp cái mã kia để vào phòng mà anh lấy về quá Thế là con đưa vào mất rồi Đỡ phải đi cộng người Và phòng của mấy cái bọn ở trên ấy Xem đi đi <cười> Đây Đây Một người nữa Một người nữa mấy giây không ai vô đây
chịu thật thấy nha số vai nha Muốn cưới sofa bắn Úi dồi ôi, 2 mít hai mít, 2 bê đẩy, một đứa không biết À một đứa chết rồi, một đứa chết rồi <cười> 